we know that the faith that we affirm in Jesus Christ is trustworthy and true? How do we maintain our faith when it is challenged by people outside the church or distorted by those within? Those are important questions for Christians today, but we aren't the first followers of Christ to ask them. Thankfully, as we navigate issues like these, we can be helped by people like Irenaeus of Lyon, one of the early defenders of the faith, and the bishop of a city in what is today southern France. The life of the early church was characterized by both tremendous growth and several threats to its existence. With regard to its growth, we read, for example, in Acts 2, that those who welcomed Peter's message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. What enabled the church to grow? Most importantly, of course, was the gospel message itself, the reconciliation of sinful humanity to God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this growth didn't happen in a vacuum. The early church benefited from several other factors. For example, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, which lasted for more than 200 years, brought relative peace to the empire. The Roman road system, which enabled easier travel, it meant that the roads that brought the Roman soldiers to Israel also allowed the gospel to be spread more easily. For some, an appeal to Jewish scripture and history. For others, shared Greek language and Hellenistic culture. All of these factors contributed to the growth of the church. Unfortunately, the early church also experienced intense persecution. Part of that was due to its separation from Judaism. In its early life, Christianity was perceived as a sect within Judaism. This was in part beneficial because it was protected as a permitted religion, meaning that Christians initially were exempt from emperor worship. However, Christianity gradually and increasingly separated from Judaism. This was encouraged not only by discussions internal to the faith, for example, the Judaizer controversy on whether or not Christians had to follow Jewish laws, and also external events, things like the Jewish revolt in 66 AD, which led to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. With its increasing separation from Judaism, Christianity now became a persecuted faith. In this context and under these new circumstances, several charges were brought against Christians. For example, they were accused of being cannibals. This might be surprising to you, but it might be understandable as well in light of some of the language that is found within Scripture. We do read, for example, in John 6, that Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Or consider the passage from Matthew 26, where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And he says, Take, eat, this is my body. And likewise, drink from this cup, all of you, for it is my blood of the covenant. It's understandable, perhaps, that Christians were accused of this. They were also accused of incest. Again, it wasn't true, but perhaps it's understandable in light of some of the language we find within Scripture and some of the practices of the early church. Christians were often called brothers and sisters, for example, in 1 Corinthians 1, and they are instructed to greet each other with a holy kiss in Romans 16. Christians were also accused of being atheists because they did not agree to worship the emperor. After Julius Caesar, it became more common to regard the emperor as a god, in fact, Domitian in the late first century required that he be addressed as Dominus or Lord or Deus, which is God. To refuse to worship the emperor was regarded as treasonous. Christians were therefore perceived as being seditious and disloyal to the state. They were also accused of being irrational and preying on the gullible. Jesus was thought to be a magician by some, and Christians were accused as of superstitious views that attracted just the low classes of society. So the Pax Romana, as I mentioned, might have been a time of relative peace for the empire, but it was not peaceful for Christians who were persecuted. It's important to know that persecution wasn't continual, it wasn't consistent, it depended upon which emperor was in charge, and initially it was not empire-wide, it was restricted to particular areas. And Christians were not the only ones who were persecuted, but they did suffer, sometimes even in barbaric and very public ways. Infamously, Emperor Nero was the first to persecute Christians, even tying them to poles, lighting them on fire in order to illuminate his gardens. Both Peter and Paul were executed during his reign. Emperor Decius in the third century undertook the first empire-wide persecution. In his edict of the year 250, everyone was ordered to sacrifice and burn incense to the Roman gods and to worship the emperor. 
And under Emperor Diocletian, the church suffered the great persecution, the worst persecution of Christians. Under that emperor, Christians were required to make sacrifices, and churches and scriptures were burned, and church leaders were imprisoned. There were a variety of persecutions, things that included the loss of rank and property, being excluded from public buildings, sometimes suffering mob violence or forced labor, prison, and unfortunately even martyrdom. Tertullian, an early church father, captured the feeling of Christians during that time when he wrote, If the Tiber rises to the walls, if the Nile does not rise to the fields, if the sky is rainless, if there's an earthquake, a famine, immediately the cry rises, the Christians to the lions. So how did Christians respond to persecution? Unfortunately, some Christians acquiesced. They gave in under the pressure and abandoned the faith. Some were guilty of apostasy. This included the so-called traditores, which means those who handed over, is those who handed over Christian books or sacred texts. Another way Christians responded to persecution was to suffer martyrdom, a way for them to demonstrate their faith. For example, Ignatius of Antioch, who was one of the three main apostolic fathers, along with Clement of Rome and Polycarp, he was martyred in Rome, having been thrown to the lions. And Polycarp himself, who was the bishop of Smyrna, according to tradition, was bound at the stake, but had to be stabbed when the fire wouldn't burn him. A particularly tragic story is that of Perpetua and Felicitas. Perpetua was a noblewoman and a nursing mother, and Felicitas, who was pregnant, was her slave. Both were newly baptized converts in the faith, and both were martyred in Carthage. Once again, Tertullian captured the Christian sentiment of the time saying that the blood of Christians is seed of the church. That is to say, our suffering will only lead to more growth. But another way that Christians responded to persecution was by defending the faith, by employing apologetics. Apologists had multiple purposes. Externally, they wanted to defend the faith against slander, and internally, they wanted to defend it against distortion. There were many apologists, including Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria as well, Tertullian, who I've mentioned, and Irenaeus of Lyon. Today, the city of Izmir, located on the Aegean Sea, is the third most populous city in Turkey. In the early second century, it was known as Smyrna, and it was the site of the birth of Irenaeus. Growing up, Irenaeus listened to Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, who had himself studied under John. Yes, that John, John the beloved disciple, John the Apostle. Unfortunately, Polycarp was martyred, but his influence upon Irenaeus was lasting. When the Christian communities in Gaul, and today France, suffered intense persecution, and the first bishop of the city of Lyon was killed, Irenaeus became their bishop. He's particularly known for his defense against one of Christianity's greatest challenges, Gnosticism. The early church was confronted by several heresies. I should note that the root for the word heresy comes from choose. So heresy is, quite literally, a bad choice. Some of the heresies that the early church confronted included Marcionism, which had rejected the Old Testament as authoritative for Christians, Arianism, which denied the full divinity of Jesus Christ, and Sabellianism, which denied the doctrine of the Trinity. We'll get to all those in future sessions. But perhaps the most pervasive and persistent heresy that the church confronted was Gnosticism. This was a second century movement that is thought to have begun within Christianity. Some even regard Simon Magus, the Samaritan magician who converted to the faith in Acts 8, as the founder of the Gnostic sect. Gnosticism was a diverse movement, and it had no hierarchical organization. However, there are some common themes. It was strongly monotheistic, as is Orthodox Christianity, of course, but this had implications for its view of Christ's divinity. It also had a strongly dualistic worldview. For Gnosticism, the material world was considered evil and the spiritual world was considered good. What are the implications of such a view? That, by the way, is always a great question to ask. What are the implications of this position? For starters, it denied the goodness of creation, which is clearly affirmed in Genesis. According to Gnosticism, God did not create the world. God would not get involved in something so lowly. Creation instead, according to this view, was performed by a lesser deity known as a demiurge. There were also significant implications for its understanding of Jesus Christ. It denied a genuine incarnation, for example, it denied Jesus' physical suffering, it denied the bodily resurrection, things that are fundamental to the faith. This was an early form of docetism, from the Greek word dokain, meaning to seem or appear. 
According to this view, Jesus only appeared to be human, so it denied his full humanity. Gnosticism also affirms salvation through special knowledge. This is where actually the term comes from. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. According to this view, believers were saved by attaining a secret kind of knowledge, not readily available. It also, unfortunately, tended to be anti-Semitic and misogynistic. A good example of this is found in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the key Gnostic texts from the early second century, and a helpful reminder that just because it's called a gospel doesn't mean it's true. This text was among the Coptic texts discovered in Nag Hammadi in 1945. It's helpful because it allows us to understand Gnostic beliefs directly rather than relying upon interpretations of their opponents. In this text, we see an appeal, for example, to special knowledge, what they say are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke. It also says that women are not worthy of life and must become men in order to be saved by rejecting the physical, which was more associated with women, and pursuing instead the spiritual. Now, if Gnosticism and other early heresies had claimed to be different faiths that required a Christian response, then that would have been challenging enough for early apologists. The greater difficulty here was that they claimed to represent the faith. So how would Irenaeus and others respond to this? Irenaeus wrote Against Heresies, an appropriate title, to combat the dangers of Gnosticism. But how was he supposed to argue that he had the correct understanding of the faith, especially when the canon of Scripture had not yet been formalized? He appealed instead to the importance of apostolic tradition. You remember that the early church was gathered around the teaching of the apostles. In defining tradition, he says, we refer to that tradition which originates from the apostles, which is preserved by means of the successions of presbyters in the churches. Now, Christianity has always had some version of tradition, whether oral or written, which has sought to preserve and articulate the faith. In later centuries, Christianity developed creeds, confessions, and catechisms. But long before then, and within Scripture itself, Paul points to the importance of handing down the faith. He writes, For I handed down to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins, it accords with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. It accords with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. So what Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 15 is a great example of tradition being handed down. And while most Christians have regarded the church's forms of, of tradition to be secondary to scripture, Irenaeus showed the importance of tradition as well. In opposing Gnosticism, he appealed to the fact that he had studied with Polycarp, who had, you'll remember, studied with John, who had, of course, been taught by Christ himself. So he could appeal to that apostolic tradition, tracing it back to Jesus himself. So let me come back to my opening questions. How do we know that the faith that we affirm in Christ is trustworthy and true? How do we maintain our faith when it is challenged? For Irenaeus, he was certain that his views regarding the goodness of God's creation, the reality of Christ's incarnation and resurrection, and the truth of salvation were correct because he could trace his beliefs directly to the teaching of the apostles, even to Jesus himself. And so that enabled him to reject the idea of salvation through a secret knowledge and any understanding of Jesus that would deny his incarnation, his suffering, his bodily resurrection. Instead, he affirmed that Christ alone brings salvation by taking on flesh. He writes, for instance, he who was the son of God became the son of man, that man had been, having been taken into the word and receiving the adoption might become the son of God. Against heresies, Irenaeus' work was forgotten for nearly a thousand years, but it was rediscovered and published later by Erasmus in the 16th century. I should note that despite the church's opposition to Gnosticism, it still persisted in various forms. It's a good reminder that just because the church determines that a particular view is not consistent with orthodoxy, not consistent with scripture, doesn't mean that the heresy immediately disappears or that all Christians immediately abandon that view. The Christian faith requires articulation and defense in every age. Irenaeus' contributions to the faith extended beyond his defense against Gnosticism. In particular, he helped the church begin to articulate its understanding of several other key aspects, including the doctrines of the Trinity, Scripture, and the church's understanding of itself. It took the church several centuries to carefully and painstakingly articulate a doctrine of the Trinity as the uniquely Christian understanding of the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll be looking at that in another session. But Irenaeus early on showed the importance of Trinitarian language 
In fact, he referred to the Son and the Spirit as the two hands of the Father. He was referring to their work in the economy of salvation, how they helped achieve salvation. And regarding Scripture, he helped the church as it sought to determine what text should be part of the authoritative canon for the church. Marcion, an early Christian, had argued that the Old Testament presented a different God than the God who was revealed in Christ. The former, the God of the Old Testament, he thought, was a God of law. The latter, he thought, was a God of love. But thankfully, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and others opposed Marcion and Marcionism, named after him, of course, by affirming that the God who created the world and the God who entered into a covenantal relationship with the people of Israel is the same God who came into the world in the person of Christ. In particular, Irenaeus appealed to each of the four Gospels and nearly every text from what is now the canonical New Testament throughout his work against heresies. Finally, with regard to ecclesiology, that is the doctrine of the church, Irenaeus emphasized the importance of Rome, and he helped to establish an early version of Petrine succession, which was particularly important to the Roman Catholic Church. He writes, The very great, the very ancient, and universally known church founded and organized at Rome by the two most, most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, should be respected. Living under the realities of both external persecution and internal threats, the first generations of the earliest Christians preserved the faith under incredibly difficult circumstances. For these early followers of Christ, there was no expectation that the persecution of their faith would ever end. As we'll see in the next session, though, all of that was about to change.